to Out of the Box Radio with me, your host, Christine Blasdale. Out of the Box Radio is a weekly podcast of audible ear candy dedicated to bringing a fresh perspective on this thing that we call life. And each and every week, we're going to be diving into the topics that matter most with lively conversations on issues such as health, wellness, and transformational healing, all with the goal of creating a better world and becoming a happier human being. I will be your tour guide for this epic adventure, and each and every week we're going to be embarking on a journey with the ultimate goal being transformation to our highest potential. And now, let's get out of the box. everyone and welcome back to out of the box with Christine. I am your host Christine and I am so very happy that you join me today because we are going to learn how to parent. I know there's no manual on it. I know you're all freaking out if you've got kids, but we are going to be talking to an an expert right now, not only an expert in time management, but also someone who has really taken a very close look at how to organize your life yes, you, parents, and to bring out the very best in your child and yourself. She's the author of the book Time to Parent, and she is a New York Times bestselling author as well. Her name is Julie Morgenstern, and Julie, I am very happy. And as a new, hmm, I guess I am a new step-parent. I am I am uh, coming into the world of a 15-year-old and an 11-year-old. Wow. Yes. And so I am very happy to have you on Out of the Box with Christine, and I'm sure our listeners are as well. Julie Morgenstern, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. This is cool. (laughs) This is cool. Okay. Before we get into the book and why you wrote it and all those good things, let's talk a little bit about you, yourself. Um, You are from New York, yes? Yes. 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 And, um, And welcome to L.A. Thank you. <laughs> How's LA treating you? Very well. Beautiful skies. Yeah. Big, yeah, it's beautiful here. It smells good in LA. Does it? Yeah. I really it, it does. The air actually smells See, I love New fragrant. York. I love New York. I love autumn in New York. Oh yeah, I do too. Yeah. It's great. The winters are a little they can be. They're a little tough. They can be. When I, I was there uh, a few years ago in February. Yeah. And I remember walking around and like shaking people's hands and going, you are tough people. You know, that's, that, is the, that is the street cred of New York. Oh, my God. People are always feel like, oh, New Yorkers aren't friendly. New Yorkers have utter respect for every other person walking down the streets because it's such a tough city yeah. to survive in. You just sort of like nod your head to everybody. But what I noticed, because I grew up in Los Angeles and I've spent some time in New York, not a lot, but for, for work. What I love about New York, first of all, is that New Yorkers are real. Okay? Yes. When you go in and you get a bagel, the bagel guy is a bagel guy or the pizza guy is a pizza guy. He's not trying to sell a script, right, or anything like that. He's not. Right. He is real. Yeah. And the second thing was, was... Actually, when you reach out to somebody walking on the street, when you say, how you doing? Or, oh, my gosh, you look great or whatever. They they respond and react to you. Yeah. And in L.A., you know, it's a little different. It's a little different. That's very Julie. interesting to me. I or mean, you we think could, we're all friendly we here. Could, no. Yeah. Like, I'm, well, the old thinking was that New Yorkers were hard to connect to and L.A. was really friendly. But then the, in New York, it was more deep. And in L.A. it was more superficial. Uh, that was the old sort of cliche. I don't know if all that still stands. I just, I love New York and I love the Apollo Theater. Oh, yeah. I'm Wednesday nights. Amazing. Amateur night at the Apollo. Amazing. I have friends, whenever they're going to New York, I go, go and, I, just, get your, just get tickets for Wednesday night at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. And they're like, well, really? Is that where? I, uh, that's it. Yes. I, I went for the first time probably about three months ago and I was <gasps> blown away. I just got goosebumps. So entertaining. Old school. And the energy in there, you can't, you can't even describe it. No. It just fills you. It does. And it's historic I- as well. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. There was a singer. Was it Ella Fitzgerald? It was a singer, a jazz singer, and I can't remember now who exactly it was, but she uh, said she used to 
uh, cut cut from school, cut class, and she would go to the Apollo Theater and sit up, uh, sit in the back, okay. and that's yeah. how she cut class. Yeah, she would just listen to the There's beautiful a lot singing. Of, a lot of energy in that space. Yes, there is. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about your um, how you you are here right now, mm-hmm. and how you how you got to this point. Number one, how you are how you became a world renowned. Like just not New York renowned, but a world renowned organizing and time management expert. My hat is tipped off to you, <laughs> first of all. But how did you how did you get into that field? You've thirty years you've been doing this. Yeah. Wow. I've been doing it for thirty years. So my background, if we go way, way back, I was actually a theater person. And I was very right brain, creative person, and actually felt pretty disorganized growing up. I lived out of piles. I spent half my day looking for things. Everything I turned into school was late, yeah. <laughs> overnighters, you know, always losing things. And when I got to grad school, I it really caught up with me. I was in Chicago. I was in the theater school. And I was in classes all day and rehearsals all night. And I was like, I, I had no time, no order to my life. There was never anything in the fridge. You know, I never had cash. It was before ATM machines. And I was like, I wish there was some sort of service that would rescue me from my chaos. Because I craved order, but I had no idea how to get there. I just, I I didn't know how to begin. I didn't, it's like I wanted it, but I couldn't. And I was a little bit afraid of it too, because I thought as a creative person, it will mess my mojo. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I was very afraid of squelching my creativity. So when my daughter was born, I learned very quickly, I can live my life in chaos, but I can't do this to another human being. She will never get out of the house. I'm never going to get her to kindergarten. I'll never fill out the form on time. And I became very motivated to learn to get organized as a parent. And a few years later, when I got divorced, I thought, I can't afford theater hours or money anymore but I think I can help people get organized. And that's when I started the business. How did you how did you get started with that? How do people find out about you? Well, I there was a paper called the Big Apple Parents Paper. And I do <laughs> think that the the there's uh, still like a parenting newspaper that I'm sure is all over the country. And it was a monthly publication and I knew every parent I knew read it and kept copies on their coffee table for a long time. So one twenty-six dollar a classified ad would last about three months. Smart. So I got my an ad and I got my first client and I took all the money I made from that client and placed a half page display ad in the second month. And then, because uh, I thought big looks established and credible. Yeah. And then I got more clients. And then the paper asked me, are you going to renew? And I was like, well, I can't, I'll never stay in business if I pay for half to pay. And they said, well, let's barter because uh, they needed to get organized. And ah! for the next <laughs> 18 months, I had organized their offices and I got 18 months of display ads. And my that springboarded my whole business. It springboarded your your whole business and your whole career. You um you have worked with some major companies. We're not talking just like no, you know yeah. the parents of you know Hoboken or uh, anything like that. You have had some some major clients. Uh, yeah. What is this American Express? Yeah, Harpo. Yeah, that must have been nice. Uh, Microsoft, FedEx, the NBC Newsroom, yeah. Sony Music, State Farm Insurance, and Viacom MTV. Yeah. Wow. How did that how did you go from doing this thing with like little thing through a, like paper for parents and then boom going to these clients? You know, because people, it's all people, right? And people you start out in their home and they're like you organize me in my home, now I need help in my office, you organize my space, now I need my time. You organize my time, now I need my team's time. I mean, there's really no demographic um that is my market. It's what's kind of like what's called a psychographic. Everybody who I serve shares one thing in common is a kind of heightened awareness that disorganization of some sort is keeping them from getting to their goals. Right. And that can be a stay at home mom, that can be a CEO, that can be uh, an artist, it can be a sanitation worker. I mean, anybody, anybody, everybody, 
order can really either enable or inhibit your ability to achieve what you want in life. It's the oil in the machine of life organization. And okay. it's not a life skill that people are taught. We're not we're not taught that and we oh, we hang on to things, Julie. <laughs> we oh, we we do. There there is there is clutter in the home which also creates clutter in the mind. But also we are creatures of well, I might, you know, need that Hawaiian shirt that doesn't fit one day, you know? Yeah. I mean, stuff, we can hang on to stuff. We can hang on to time things and obligations. Memories. So it applies to time too, right? Where you put things on your schedule, it's hard for you to say no to things. Then you're really sorry you said no. You spend all your time kind of taking care of others, but not taking care of yourself. Those are also holding on to like belief systems yeah. that just weigh you down. You've written quite a few books on on this subject. Um, I'm just uh, naming, I guess, a few. Organizing from the inside out, time management from the inside out, organizing from the inside out for teens. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, also, I love this one. Shed your stuff, change your life. Yeah. Great title. Thank you. What's the subtitle on that? Um, that is a great question. I, I shed your stuff, change your life. Or that was uh, it. Use it, uh, it could be. But it, it basically, a great, that's a book about decluttering. It's a great title. As a catalyst for change. It's fantastic. That right there um, is such a great title that you don't have to even say anything else after exactly. that. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And then um, a, another one of your, um, one of the, the books that you have, have written that is, Relating to, and we can all relate to this. I mean, every single listener who's listening to this can relate to this in regards to workplace pr productivity, but also our home life, our work life, work and home life balance. You have something that you have written called Never Check Email in the Morning. Yeah. Oh, can you just tell our listeners? I know we're talking, we are going to talk about your most current book. Okay. Okay, Julie. But that's but, all right. But all this got I me love to this, that book. I love so. these, I, and I love these titles and I love these themes. So Never Check Email in the Morning. So uh, basically, that's a strategy. Uh, never check email in the morning. It's it, This is a book on, on workplace productivity and also to stay organized at work for work-life balance and how all of that inter interacts. But never check email in the morning is really you should not start your day with email or any screen time. And, and, and in reality, the first hour of your day and the last hour of your day should be completely screen free. And most people listening, I'm sure you're like, oh, wait, that's the first thing I do. Say this once again. Yes. Please. The first and last hour of every day should be completely screen free. And we are the complete opposite. Yes. And why do you say that? Say that because screens are a reactive device. So you wake up and if the first thing you do is look at a screen, you are immediately kick into reactive mode. And you're either whatever you had on your plate to do is long gone from your memory. And you're now like, Oh, my God, these people still need this for me. And huh, I forgot that. And why are they still and holy moly and and you're just now off to the races. And it's you've very up, you've hard. amped you're, up already you've amped up and you're in reactive mode. And it's very hard to ever turn that off the rest of the day once you start there. Mm -hmm. Right? It's very true. But if you life is not all in the screen, and we all know that in our bones and our veins, but it's a very addictive. I mean, it is really physiologically addictive. So many studies have proven that. Yeah. And that's kind of the business model. Honestly, they're selling eyeballs, right? Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. How many eyeballs can we get addicted to our software, to our this or that? So it's addictive. It's much easier to start your day with you in control of your thoughts, of being present where you are, of being in the real world and being with yourself, with the people you live with, with the animals you live with, or even just yourself and the water in the shower and the coffee you are drinking. And then you roll your shades up for business right? when you're ready. And it's easier to go from kind of focused, centered time to reactive time than to let me see what everyone else needs. Now let me turn all that off and think about me. You can't go in reverse. You have to go so forward. True. So true. And, and it's like you, a gift to yourself as well. It's a gift to yourself. And basically what you're doing is you start and end your day establishing 
you choose where your time goes, not others. And if you can avoid email and screens for the first hour of the day, any other time of the day that you need to get quiet, separate from your phone, be fully present, you'll be able to do it because you started out exercising that muscle. Right. If you can't do it for the first hour, what other hour are you going to feel like, wow, I can be off and disconnect for an hour or two? Oh, yeah. And for so many, it's the very first thing people reach for. Because that's, you know, two things. One, we use it as our alarm. And it's really hard to go to the alarm, turn it off, and not check. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's addictive and we're curious. We are. And we're not taking the time to think. And, right. And connect and be present. And that really does lead in a lot to what the new book is about. Yes, and I was gonna, <laughs> I'm, I was gonna go right there. How did you know I was gonna segue to that? Yeah. Uh, your new book, "Time to Parent: Organizing Your Life to Bring Out the Best in Your Child and You." Mm -hmm. One of the areas that you do cover, and boy, is this a big one, is the whole idea of, um, of of social media, of of, of kids and phones. And when you're talking about time to parent and, and about a parent being able to communicate with their children or to get them to do things, if it's to play or to learn or to communicate with the family and grow, yeah, boy, there is something you, you're very correct that it is a very it is very addictive. And there are lots and lots of children that are completely addicted to social media if not a phone which they they're carrying around yeah 24 hours a day yeah um then it would be the internet but mostly it's it's phones and ipads and, and um iPads, yes. you know which little kids you know it's like entertain it's entertaining put the kid on the thing so that you as a parent can get some me time or quiet time and it's not a new thing for parents to want to plunk their kid in front of something to I get a little put, time for themselves. Yep, I remember being put in front of the te television. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. But the screens are really even more addictive than even television was. And they're yeah. overstimulating. And, you know, if kids are addicted, I guarantee you so are their parents. Oh, right. Well, right? and let's talk about that as well. Um once a a child or young person <sighs> becomes into that world because it is a different world yeah getting them out very hard is extremely difficult it is i really think screen addiction is going to be the corn syrup it's going to be looked back upon in 50 years as like it's the corn syrup of our generation where it's this addictive thing that really just was very hard to separate from. So we've all gotten the sugar message, right? And here we are in California. Yes. And I, you know, healthy food and yes, kids love cotton candy, but parents will say this is how much and no matter how much their kid is having a tantrum, they're going to say it's just not healthy for you. It's just not good for you. And we need to do that. And I think our society's gotten there. I think everybody knows it just feels wrong to constantly be living life in a screen instead of looking up and engaging. You need a balance. But having a balance requires mindfulness and um, you, you basically as a parent now, now to, need to become a media mentor to your kids. Well, it, and, and the big, I mean, not the big thing. There's so many I issues with it. We, we could go into the whole thing of uh, online bullying and um, predators, okay? You go into, a, a child will be, oh, it's just my Snapchat friends or my so-and-so friends. And they don't realize that there are predators out there seeking their information, trying to find out where they live, stalking them. You know, th they don't understand that fully because yeah. they live in that open kind of naive, yeah. naive world. Yeah. But um, there's also the aspect of lack of physical, a at least, I mean, we, when I was a kid, I think we had TV time. OK, so we couldn't watch television really until, you know, this time from this time to this time. And it was OK. Yeah. And then at a certain point, television you can't watch television anymore. You need to get ready for bed. You need to brush your teeth. You need to do your homework or whatever. Right. But with the, with the screens, it's like it, it's become such a drug that um, it's very, very difficult to pull them off of that and to get them to move. At least we moved. Yeah. 
Totally. And, and, but I think that the principle really is, applies. And the American Academy of Pediatrics has actually gotten highly involved in this because it is an epidemic issue. And they issue guidelines every year on appropriate screen use for kids at every single age and stage of childhood. Because the brains are developing. The brains are developing, exactly. And, and, and we're losing that human connection and connectedness. Right. And that human connectedness has been found recently, in recent like 10, 15 tw- years of human development science, close connected connection not only builds self-esteem and validation, which we all could, that's sort Hello. of intuitive, yes. right? right? And it's like self-esteem and self-confidence. Somebody sees me, recognizes me, validates my existence. But more than that, it directly impacts the development of the brain and the executive function of the brain, which is the ability to organize, to exercise judgment, to prioritize, to control impulses, to break projects down, mm-hmm. and lifelong health. Right. I mean, literally, um, there was a probably the most mind. Bl- I did a lot of research for this book because I, though I'm a time management expert and I've worked with families all over the world, I I'm not a I'm not a child I'm not a parenting expert. So I read. And um, there was a series of landmark studies that, to me, blew my mind, where kids of lower socioeconomic upbringings have a predilection in adulthood to adult-onset chronic diseases that are like pro-inflammatory and diabetes. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and it's the direct result of all of the kind of stressors, Stress. right, which has an impact on the body. Right. But in these landmark longevity studies that follow kids all the way into adulthood, 45% of that population that was studied did not develop those adult onset diseases. And there was only one thing that they all had in common, a close, connected, nurturing caretaker. Mm -hmm. One, a mother that was close and nurturing, a grandparent, a dad. That is how powerful the ability just one-on-one, I see you, I'm connected. And so these, it's really lifelong health. So I know we're all like screen addicted. I can get screen addicted. As much as I know this, it pulls you in. If parents or caretakers or the village around a kid took one thing away, Mm -hmm. is put that phone away for short bursts, like five to 15 or 20 minutes at a time. That's all kids need. That's the science says, of undivided attention and put the phones away and just break, detox your family. If you're all addicted and you're like, At, right. you're in the throes of it with 11 and 15 year olds. I mean, we can talk about that some more in yeah. a minute. <laughs> well, and, and it is, you. there is a detox that has to happen. There is a detox. I mean, there are some, there are some um, um, of kids who, if you, if you do just take away the device just for, a short while they lose their mind yeah but i mean i know adults that do too you're climbing the walls what am i missing oh my god yeah. and you don't even know what to do with an hour of uninterrupted time i know plenty of adults but you know the the good news is that the it it takes a very short amount of time for the brain to kick into the deeper gear it right. does not take weeks right literally it takes a few hours right it's not you just gotta like Get over that hump of the instant reward that you get from a screen. And then all of a sudden the brain kicks into a deeper gear and it's like, oh, I remember how to play games. And I know what it's like to take a walk and pay attention to the bark on the trees and the leaves on the trees and the sky and what does it smell like and like tune into the senses. It's, It's right in there. No matter what, it's well, in the human Well, because that's our body. natural state. That's exactly that's right. That's where that's where our homeostasis is. That's right. Um, in in your book, Time to Parent: Organizing mm-hmm. Your Life to Bring Out the Best in Your Child and You, you have some really important um, uh, things that basically easy to remember um, little parenting tips for folks. Because here's here's the thing: if we all had, you know. A decent amount of money in the bank and we could just stay at home, didn't have to work, didn't have the different stressors that we had, we probably would be able to focus quite a bit more on our children and, and, and what they need. But we have uh, a lot of people have to work full time. Some people are 
underpaid and overworked. Some um, are doing this on their own, mm -hmm. single parents, mm -hmm. you know, recently divorced parents, stressed from the uh, estranged or ex-partner. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes there's blended families, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I get is there's just not enough time. There's just not enough time I, to do what yeah. needs to be done because you got to get the, the get them ready for you know get, uh, prepare lunch. You got to make the dinner. You got to clean the clothes. You got to so for those parents that are pulling their hair out and they're going, oh okay, time to parent. Where where am I going to find time to yeah. parent, Jolie? Okay, you talk to them. So first of all, let me just tell you this: most of us, most people, are really afraid to read another parenting book because it's going to put things on our to do list and it's going to add guilt to our already high guilt load. Right. This book will do the exact opposite. I wrote it to take things off your to-do list. Nice. And to remove the guilt and really give you the ability to just have deeper joy and be present in everything you do. So the reason I wrote this book is when my daughter was born, um, I was like, where's the instruction manual? <laughs> I literally was shocked that there were not time management brochures handed out to me at the hospital when she was born, in the pediatrician's waiting rooms every time I took her to the doctor. They give you nothing, do they? In the school <laughs> offices of her elementary school through high school. How was I supposed to divide my time between these conflicting priorities? And by the way, I was a single parent. Mm -hmm. I raised my daughter on my own from the time she was three. But even when I was married, I was just like, how am I supposed to do this? And in my work as a time management coach around the world, same theme from parents everywhere. How do I choose between conflicting priorities? Being there for my kid or, and not losing myself. Right. Uh, time with my significant other if I have one. Right. Or get back on and get more work done because my workload is so crazy and I, I'm never done when I leave at five or six o'clock. Correct. Friends, family, how do I do this? And one thing I've learned as a time management coach is that job ambiguity in any position is a total recipe for overwork, inefficiency, and insecurity. Mm. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what your job is, how do you know your day is done? Exactly. If you don't know what your job is, how can you evaluate where are my strengths? I got that down, but blind spots. I don't need, uh, oh God, I better bone up on my public speaking skills because I have to present at board meetings. If you don't have that, you can't gauge right. and your job feels infinite. It's never over. And that is how overwhelming. Parents, that's how parents have been parenting for generations. There's no instruction manual. So that's the problem that I wanted to solve. And I spent eight years researching and writing and thinking, and I was already had an empty nest. So I had a little distance and I was able to come up with a really simple way to think about the time balance that you really have to achieve to raise a human that's happy, healthy, and self-confident mm -hmm. and be a human that's happy, healthy, and self-confident. There's and the that's rub. What that, you can do it. Well, what I'm saying is that, that, that the collective, not collective wisdom, but the... Uh, I guess what has been thought is that I need to, th you know, it's it's either that that thing of I need to throw all my extra time into my children. That's right. If I suffer because I don't get to do certain things, that's fine. The number one thing that I think uh, parents go through is guilt. Yeah, it's guilt. There's two things that keep parents from spending time on self care. One is guilt. Exactly what you just said, Chris, which is like this sort of societal like uh, imprinting that you have any time, it goes to your kid or your job, not to you, right? But the second is our approach. So in the book, I talk about, I break the job into two parts. And then for the self-care, there's four components that you have to juggle your time between in order to be happy, healthy, and sort of nourished so you can nourish another and it spells this acronym. That's what you were, I think, referring to. So it's yeah. self, fueling yourself, S-E-L-F. We need to sleep, oh, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Hard to do as a parent, but you need to become a sleep ninja. You need to exercise, right? That's the E, exercise to feel fit and healthy and energetic. Just get things moving. 
Yeah. You need to invest time and love relationships as an adult to other adults, whether it's significant other or friends. And you need F is for fun, right? Because fun keeps us feeling like us, honestly, like you feel like you. S-E-L-F. What keeps us from spending time on any of those things is guilt and our approach. And what we think is we're, we need big blocks of time to do all that stuff. But we don't. Right. Exercise, we have this, again, it's like in our head, oh, exercise, it has, it's three days a week at the gym for an hour plus half an hour to get there. And then I come home and then I have to change. So that's a two-hour thing. As a parent, no way. I can't do it. So I might as well not exercise at all. It's all or nothing. But the truth is, exercise, high-intensity interval training has been, it's like scientifically proven to be even better for you than three days a week for 90 minutes. Right. That's 10 minutes or less a day that you can do from home. High-intensity interval training And is, you can do it from home. You yeah. can do it from home. And then you just build up and literally just go online. Everybody listening, go on YouTube and just put in seven-minute workout nine minute workout, five minute workout, and you will have amazing choices. And these work. Nice. And if you just do that, you every parent, no matter how busy you are, can fit in a seven minute workout. Yeah. Five days a week. Exactly. And that's that will get you as fit as 90 minutes three times a week. And it's not just the fitness, it's the serotonin, is it the serotonin? Yeah, the or serotonin and the- uh, Dopamine? And, uh, the dopamine and the, and, uh, what's the word? It's all the feel good stuff. It is the feel good stuff. It actually changes your brain chemistry. It changes your mood. So then when something happens, when, when, the, when, the, when, you, when the kid comes back with the report card with an F or something, you, you're able to handle it a little bit differently. That's exactly right. Right? Because you're in a better headspace. You're in a better headspace. You've taken care of yourself. You're grounded. You're not operating on fumes. You're like, okay, we can deal with that. Yeah. So that's, that's exercise. You can do the same thing with your love relationships. You can do the same thing with fun. It's changed the texture of how you fit self-care in. Not long blocks, but like think in 20-minute segments. Exactly. I I want to um to go into this idea of cuz boy as as parents we can be really tough on ourselves. Yeah. And this idea that we again you know have to be perfect or um I I personally love the I love to embrace the idea of being perfectly imperfect. Mm -hmm. In other words, we, we all have our flaws. We all have our weaknesses. We all have our fears. We all have our, our moments, right? Where maybe uh, if you're you know, rushing out the house, you're trying to get to work, you're trying to get the kids out to school, but then one has maybe a meltdown or something happens and they're like, I can't find my shoes or, you know, and you have that short little temper or something where you, you know, you go, hey, get in the car or whatever. Yeah. Let's talk about that and how as parents we're able we can be able to tap into forgiving ourselves too oh, yeah. for that for that um not being perfect yes. all the time. Yeah. First of all, there's every single parent, no parent, every parent makes mistakes multiple times a day. Just accept that. You are not going to be a perfect parent. It's not possible. This is a tough job and no human is perfect anyway. Exactly. Resilience Actually, if you were too perfect, that's a pretty high bar for a kid to sort of follow. Right. Which means if you're perfect all the time, they have to be perfect all the time. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. What is better is if you show how you can be resilient when you make a mistake. That you're like, you know, I, I didn't handle that well. Can we do a redo? Yeah. And then you role model. You can make mistakes and you can correct them. And it's repairable and there's resilience and you have to, you want to forgive yourself. I actually, in the book I wrote, my assistant, Tatiana, who, um, you know, I was helping me with the book. She told me that she had an aunt who had a habit of every night before she went to bed, she would forgive herself. I love that. I know. I love that because I, I see so many people walking around um, so they're so hard on themselves yeah. and they can't forgive themselves for a whole host of different things that maybe even it happened, you know, a long time ago, but they kick themselves again. They're like, why did I do that? You know, they beat yeah. themselves up. 
And that from a time management lens, right? You're already time stretched as a parent. You're way time stretched. Through a time management lens, guilt and feeling bad literally steals probably 30% of the time you had every day Mm -hmm. and 30% of your headspace. So if you could release that guilt, you get 30% of your time back in your hands. And then you could divvy that up between your kid and you. Right. Let's let's talk about some some practical things. Sure. Let's talk about some some uh, some ways that we can um, that we can spend with our kids and um, make time and 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 how how much time are we supposed to say? Is there, you said there's no manual. It's true. There's no manual like spend exactly 15 minutes. You know. But but what are some of those guidelines to help people, especially those that have you know that that uh, especially if they're if they're working or if they're a single parent? Yeah, for sure. So first of all. I told you there's four types of self time that you have to spend that spell S-E-L-F, sleep, exercise, love, fun. There's four kinds of time you need to divide your time between to raise a human being. And those spell an acronym PART, as in doing your part for someone. Provide is the first, right? That's working, managing money to pay for stuff. Right. How do you raise a kid without money? You You got to feed them. do it. You do have to feed the little guys. You do. (laughs) And they keep, like, wanting the next meal. I I don't get it. Didn't we have dinner last night? (laughs) Didn't we eat this morning? Okay, provide. The next A is arrange. That's arranging all the logistics of your kids' lives. That's a big, big job that no one understands how big and complex that is. Soccer practice. Soccer practice. Music lessons. Yeah, filling out the forms. Where are they going to school? How are they getting there? What Who's field picking trip? who up? What field, what, what? I was supposed to be, I was supposed to pick you up when? Right? That's arrange. So provide and arrange. Yeah, P-A, so far. Mm-hmm. So far. Now we have the R. Yes. Relate. That's what we're talking oh, about. Oh, we got to relate? You got to relate to your kids, which is very hard. I put so you know a little asterisk on that. We'll come back. That is, but that is where you really get to know who is this unique individual, and they feel seen and known and validated and understood and accepted, right? Yes. And then you have to te- teach your kids. You have to teach your kids life yes. skills and values so they can succeed in the world, right? P A R T. P A R T. Provide and arrange. Take a massive amount of time. Yes. That's the work. People have jobs that's 50 hours a week. If they're it's the doing grocery shopping. Jobs, no, providing is working. Right. Arranging, Arranging is, is grocery, grocery shopping, shopping and errands and, right. you know, what are we cooking for dinner and how, who's cleaning up and we got to keep the house clean. And those two things take keeping a Keeping the massive, schedules of everybody. Keeping the schedules. And right. not only takes so much time, it takes a lot of headspace, right? Like you can never turn off your to-do list on the arrange. Right. Relate and teach take significantly less time but they are the hardest to make the time for particularly relate and they're the most i mean High i'm not impact. gonna say the most powerful but they are boy are they powerful they are the most powerful and the good news is that um kids don't need large blocks of uninterrupted time which is what we think especially a working parent feels like i was working all day oh we think that they need to have us sit down with them for hours exactly they don't they don't want that either do they they actually (laughs) don't so that was the that was the one question i had when i did that research which was how much time and attention do kids need to feel loved and secure because if we get the answer to that that's the edges you're good you can figure out how okay here it was hard to get the answer but here's what it is short bursts and when i say short bursts five to 15 minutes or 20 minutes at a time tops delivered consistently Uh uh-huh kids have short attention spans word exactly and experts say calculate about one minute for every age of life stop and think about that a one-year-old has about a one minute attention span and then their eyes like drift off yeah to the next shiny object five-year-old five minutes yes 15 year old 15 minutes tops tops yeah right so that's very liberating. And then what you do is you don't have to add time. What you have to do is just ch- use the time you have with them at each of the transition points in their day. When they first wake up. Yeah. When you send them off to school. When you get home from work, dinner, bedtime. Those like touch points. Yes. Take the first five to seven, ten minutes for direct 
connecting with your kid. Not wake up, where's your backpack, we're late, but how'd you sleep, feeling rested, what'd yeah. you dream about, What what's happening today, you excited about it, you worried about it, connect for five, seven, eight minutes, then you get on with all this sort of logistics and getting them ready. If you do that at every touch point in the day, the first contact, first reconnection, that's what kids thrive on. That's the foundation. It makes them feel loved and secure. Big blocks of time are bonuses. They could make memories. They're great. But if you want to know what makes a kid feel loved and secure, it's those short bursts short delivered bur- consistently. consistently. So, yeah. So, and that's beautiful because that we can do. Exactly. Julie, that, that, that we can, we can pretty much carve out in a, in a day. Sometimes, some days will be hectic and crazy and, you know, something will happen. Yes. But you're right. If that's something that they can also depend on. Yes. And they know that throughout the day, you're going to check in with them. Yeah. Then they have that sense of, of, uh, of security. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, cause I remember as a kid, like I didn't want to have like super long conversations with my parents. No, I was, I was fine with them checking in Yeah, and how you doing? Everything good. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Fantastic. Right. I'm doing this. You're doing that. Okay. Then as a child, you want to go, you want to go play with your friends. Yeah. You know, you want to do that social interaction with people that are your age. Yeah. Or I would, you know, I would go play with my dog. Or do your own thing. And and once you have those short bursts of connection, then that together but apart time where you're doing your thing, the kids are doing their thing. It's all good. It's great. It's also very healthy and good for kids' development. This is good for any relationship. Exactly. This is good for like romantical uh, relationships. Exactly. You don't have to be with each other all the time, all the time. No. But just knowing that throughout the day, there's, you're checking in and, yes. and spending some time. Throughout consistently. Right. And it's at the first point of reconnection. This is the other thing I think is very mm-hmm. liberating. We have a habit, and I, 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 in the book I talk about it, like you have to learn to make mindful transitions. And before you cross any threshold, stop, let go of whatever you were doing, and set your intention for the, who you're going to be and what's going to happen on the other side of that door. So when you're coming home from work, don't be like, on the phone or finishing your work or bring work and spill it over into the house. Five minutes before you walk through that door, finish up your last work task and set your intention. When I walk through that door, I'm going to light up when I see my spouse, my kids. Hey, everybody, how was your day? Be ready to give and receive, Yeah. connect, and then go do your thing. Right. And people, we don't do that. We just sort of like sloppily go from Work time to family time, from kid time to adult time. We're still checking our work emails when we're walking in the door. You put the kids to bed and you go to spend time with your significant other and you're still in kid mode and you sit down and you're like, oh my God, the kids, blah, blah, blah. Now everyone's falling asleep and you never had any couple time. Yeah. So it's about making those mindful transitions five minutes before you cross the threshold. Connect and then it's, it's, it's very simple. And just requires mindfulness. These are, and it does not add time. It changes the nature of the time you're already spending. Right, right. You had one more part. Of, well, on, on one more part. Uh, so there's provide, arrange, relate, and teach. Teach the children well. Yes. <laughs> and when you say teach, uh, I know that parents are probably sitting there going, oh, great. So I got to work. I got to clean. I got to do all this. And now I got to I got to teach them. I thought that they go to school for teaching. It's a different kind of teaching. I, I know I am playing devil's advocate. No, no, you're right. I mean, I'll tell you something. When I was raising my daughter, teach. <laughs> I wasn't I did not feel very confident in that area. I didn't mm. actually feel like I had like, what am I? What, what, what do I, do I know? <laughs> I don't know anything. I'm just figuring this out every day. <laughs> I have no life skills to teach her. I was a young parent. I had her when I was 26. I literally, like, oh, I yes. did not feel confident. Right. And so I really avoided that role. I taught by role modeling, which is actually the way kids learn mostly anyway. Totally. No matter what you say. It's yeah. what you do. They are watching you like hawks and they will yep. model, which is another reason why you want to model good self-care because you want to model for them what is happy, healthy adulthood look like because right. that's what you want them to do. 
Right. So do exercise and sleep, et cetera, right? Yes. But so I role model, but I, I like never felt good at lecturing or teaching. But teaching is really about no matter what the school teaches, you don't have to be the homework, you know, you don't have to teach your kids math. That's a whole other subject. Homework. It's a whole, I know. <laughs> You're supposed to just be kind of a homework enabler, but not the homework. Give them a time and a space and the materials and make the house quiet and have house study time. Yeah. So kids don't feel isolated when they're doing their homework. You're reading. It's like family study we're all hour. Study, right. We're right. all studying. We're all, we're all learning. We, aren't we still learning? Don't you still want to yeah. learn something? So just create an environment that shows here's your time and space to do it. We're all in it with you. But um, here's the difference. I think parents tend to a lot of times confuse and conflate teach and relate. Mm. Mm. Right? But they're different. So here's a way to think about it. When you are teaching, the child is the student of you. Yes. And you're bringing them into sort of the adult world. This is how the world works. This is what you have to do to be. When you are relating, you are the student of the child. Bam. Well, that just exploded in my head. Yep. <laughs> right? Exactly. I got gotcha. you. You got it? Oh, now, yeah. And you take those adolescents you're talking I about. I got gotcha. you. And that is the hardest period of a human's life is adolescence. We know that. Yeah. You would never want to go back to adolescence, would you? Hell no. <laughs> so they are going through the most vulnerable, difficult, uh, self-doubting, where do I fit in? Am I good enough? Hormones. Hormones. It's just... Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Sleep. Their brains are changing. They, they, they're they just all off. It's you smell hard. funny? Yeah. <laughs> The best way to connect, what we want to do is try to teach them through that, right? The impulse is, listen, don't be intimidated by like, don't, you know, whether you got invited to the party and you're too, we try to coach and teach them. The best thing to do in adolescence is relate before you teach. Yes. When your kid has a tantrum, it's like, oh my God, I don't know what to wear. I feel so stupid. I feel it. Like, just go, I hate it when I feel that way. I totally get that feeling. It, and it just deflates it, not, why do you feel that way? Don't feel that way. Don't feel that way. Let me teach you a better way to think. No. And experts really do say, if you want to teach kids, start by relating. And think about, isn't that how we all learn? Right. If a teacher right. just talks at you and doesn't get show that they get who you are. You shut down. Yeah. Of course you do. Yeah. Same principle. Yeah. You totally do. And um, interesting too, when you have the the whining, yeah. Um, most parents, the their immediate thing would be to try and shut that shut that down, shut that off, because it's ah, it's just oh my gosh, it's grating. You got stuff to do, and you hear you know have the tantrum. The, yeah. the tantrum happens. So, what are do you have some? Because uh, you've done this, you've you've had the the tantrums. Oh yeah. What do you do? Do you do you, you do you do relate to them and you go, you know what? I would totally lay on the floor and fling all my arms and legs just like that if if I, you know, couldn't find my shirt. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, the, it, yes. And like kind of at any age. Here's what I interviewed this woman named Claire Lerner, who's a parenting expert, social worker, brilliant. And she said that when kids are having tantrums can actually be quality time. Say what? Mm-hmm. Because what you do is you go and you connect. And it's how you, it's sort of become their emotion coach. When kids are having a tantrum, they're like feeling something. And you say, I totally, it, I know it is so frustrating. Uh, it's frustrating. Uh, yeah. Or is it maddening? Or is it scary when I that I know happens? it must feel really frustrating right now. Right. And they don't have the words. Like we have to realize kids don't have the language to right. describe these big feelings. But you're going with them. Go with them and help You're, them identify what they're feeling. Right, and when they're when they're ah, all that stuff, instead of saying no, stop it, you stop because because then it's like boom, boom, right, right. Uh, opposites attracting. Right. When when they're going down that spiral, yeah, because that's a spiral, yeah, and they're losing their. Um, when you go along with them, you're helping them to dif dif diffuse it a bit, because you're not having an opposite force, right. So you're in the boat with them. You're in the boat with them and you're helping them name what they're feeling. Right. Use right? your words. Use your, yeah. So <laughs> Use you're feeling your this or I'm feeling, or I, you know, 
Right. And I get it. And go ahead and feel that for a while, and then we can talk after you calm down. I like that. I, one. Um, oh my gosh, the time is going by so fast. No, yeah. no. But one of the uh, one of the sections of your book, "Time to Parent: Organizing Your Life to Bring Out the Best in Your Child and You," by Julie Morgenstern. People, um, one of the uh, the sections is on when life throws you curveballs. Yeah, and I really. Um, I'm so grateful to you that you included this in in your book. Um, some of those curveballs can be um, big curveballs. Mm-hmm. Um, illness, mm-hmm. job loss, mm-hmm. uh, your you know as a parent, your job loss. Okay, exactly. um, a death in the family, mm-hmm. divorce, mm-hmm. which is, I mean, that probably I would say. Well, all of those things really impact uh, children in, in growing up, but the the divorce and perhaps also the the death of um, of a loved one, of a parent, or of a sibling would have a huge impact on them. When life throws you curveballs, um, let's talk about that and and how we how we interact with our children. Mm-hmm. Especially with, I uh, like with divorce because you know a, a lot of a lot of people get divorced. Yeah, a lot of families. Um, a lot of, yeah, yeah. Whenever life, th- so again, I take this through the time management lens. Yes. When life throws you a curveball, any of these curveballs, there's way more to do, right? And you're doing something like the to do list of a divorce. Oh my God, we got to find a mediator. We got to find a lawyer. We got to, you know, we have to make these decisions. There's a gazillion new things you've never done before that are now piled on your to do list on top of your every day. Got to cook and yeah. clean and get the kids, blah, blah, blah. So there's a boatload of extra work. Plus the emotional. Plus there's huge emotional energy, time, and time for you. Yeah. And there's also huge emotional disruption for the kids. Yes. What the basic principle is when life throws you curveballs, you've got to do two things that are very counterintuitive. The goal here is don't let a curveball disconnect you from these things that we most are most important. We all thrive on, which is time and attention yes. with your kids and self-care. Self-care. Right. So how do you do that? First of all, to get through a curveball, number one, engage other people. Get help. Get as much help this as you is something possibly. That, but yeah. so many, especially hardworking uh, moms, they're like, "I can do it on my own," you or cannot. "I don't want to burden anyone." Exactly. I'll get through this. I'll do it all. I don't want to. You know, I, I. There's some shame involved, or or feeling embarrassed, so they feel they take all of this on on themselves. Yeah, they do. I, more than anything else, when I coach parents and particularly women, I hear exactly what it's like. I don't want to burden other people. These are my kids. They're my responsibility. I'm not going to put, I feel like I'm shirking my responsibility or I don't want to burden other people. And here's how I put as much as I can and into that. I ask you, when someone is in trouble or overwhelmed and they ask you to help, how do you feel? Wonderful to help them. Yes. Why? Because they need it. Because they need me. And what does that do for you? Makes me feel good. Makes you feel good. It makes you feel valuable. Needed, wanted. Needed, wanted. Yeah. Why deny other people that pleasure? Boom. When you won't share the workload, you're literally denying other people the deep, necessary thing of feeling valued and being able to do something good for others yeah it's the greatest feeling in the world to help somebody and really do so and be and be trusted yes right it's like you're going to trust me to watch your kids while you go to do that or you're going to trust me to to fi- cook dinner for you so you can go to the gym and just clear your head it is a gift and you trust me to do that and it, i will do that with pleasure yeah so don't deny other people the the need to feel valued. And it also opens up the whole village for your kids. Your kids benefit yes. from multiple relationships. If they can't get it all from you, 
Right. It's not even healthy. Like different perspectives, other adults' perspectives. I mean, these have to be people you trust, of course. <laughs> but it, no one person can fulfill everybody's needs. Not you as a parent no. to all your kids' needs. Not you as a spouse to another. And get that village going. It shares the logistical burden and the emotional burden. And then you double down on your self-care. Get help on the logistics. Double down on the self-care so that you can then be there to manage your kids through this crisis. Right. If you're not putting on your own emotional oxygen mask, mm. you can't check in with how your kid's doing. Right. Right? And then they have to take care of you. No. No, 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 no. But if you don't release that logistical burden and, and get some emotional space and take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to get your kids through it with the same finesse or other focus. It's I, counterintuitive. Yeah. No, I love, I because I totally saw when you were saying that about the uh, the mask, I immediately saw an airplane with the oxygen mask coming down. And, and it's and it's true. You got to you gotta take a hit of that oxygen, make sure that you're able to function in order to take care of your child. You do. But we're not saying like go away for three weeks and hide your head in the sand. <laughs> we're talking no. about make sure you're exercising 10 minutes a day, no matter what the hell you're going through. Yeah. Make sure that you are spending some time with friends. Make sure that you're getting out and clearing your head 20 minutes at a time, not hours on end, and keep feeding yourself. It's like keep breathing in the oxygen in small bursts and then give it back to your kid in small bursts. Yeah. There's another resource I want to sort of uh, guide listeners to, which is Sesame Workshop has a series of um, tips and uh, on their website for dealing with crises and difficult times. Wow. That is just one of the greatest resources I've ever seen. So practical. And they'll give you the words and the script, how do I talk to my kids at this age or this age or this age about some of these things. It's amazing. Sesameworkshop.org. Fantastic. Yep. Julie Morgenstern, I could talk to you forever about parenting. This is cool. This has been a very, very cool hour. I want to thank you so much for, for joining us and, and being on the show. How do people find out more about you? They can come to my website, juliemorgenstern.com, and you can click on the book. And there's actually a self-assessment online version of the self-assessment on the book page, Time to Parent. And it'll give you a, a read at the moment of what is your current time balance oh. with no judgment. Nice. No judgment. <laughs> nice. Give you a little profile. And also direct you in like kind of what you can do to sort of get things back in balance. Nice. And I, I would say, yeah, so come to the website. And I also have a podcast, Time Please to Parent. Tell, I love the podcast. Tell everybody, Time everybody to Parent. Everybody come listen, Time to Parent. And you can get it anywhere you get your podcasts, on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher. Awesome. And we just launched last week. I know this is probably going to be a perpetual thing. So last week might have been, you know, six months ago by the yeah. time you're hearing this. But I love it. And it's intimate. And it's conversations with real parents and me with real problems, real practical solutions, real experts. And um, I just... Parenting is the hardest job in the world. It's the most challenging job. It's the most noble job mm. and has been the most ambiguous job. And I feel like by taking away the ambiguity and giving a simple way to organize it, just like any job, you can now work within the framework and never feel worried that you might be missing something. It's like, and you give yourself credit for what you're doing well, and you just auto-correct for the things that are a little bit blind spots for you. And you can just, and it's not perfect, but it's a it's a roadmap for life from like the birth of your first <laughs> till the launch of your last. I love it. Because every stage of parenting has time pulls in multiple directions. And kids change, and you have to learn how to change along with them to stay connected. Oh, it it's so, so true. And and I just I'm so happy that you so happy that you wrote this book, but also very, very happy that you have the podcast as well. It's time to parent the podcast with Julie Morgenstern. Also, you can go to juliemorgenstern.com. Please do pick up her, uh, her her book. She is the New York Times bestselling author of so many books. And um, and I'm just so very grateful that you joined us today. Julie Morgenstern. Thank you so very much. And thank you listeners for tuning in this week as well. Remember, if you love the show, you can share it on your different variety of devices. You can share it on social media through iTunes, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podbean, name your choice. You got it. 
And uh, please do share this information. I think it would be quite um, informative for a lot of people. Until next time, I want to remind you to always think outside of the box. Bye for now.